Industry Insider Nutshell, the show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. This video is a very special one to me because as for someone who knows people who work in the National Health Service, it is important that talking about life in hospitals is really, really good to open up and raise awareness about what it's like. But we're not talking about the present day because we're going back to 1916 as for Britannic months, we are going to be continuing this month with something very special and this is something that I've researched for a very long time but the amount of research was worth it and now I am going to narrate this video because I feel this deserves to be told. Behind the scenes, what was life like on board a hospital ship? In the summer of 1914, Britain declared war on Germany, which would spark a war between European nations and later the rest of the world. During the First World War, 77 vessels were requisitioned into hospital ships by the British government and Royal Navy and 13 of them sank during military service and one of them was the HMHS Britannic. The Britannic began her maiden voyage in December 1915 when she undertook her service from Liverpool to the Greek island of Lamos. When she sank near the island of Kia, the Britannic put herself in mortal danger, which proved that not all hospital ships were safe from German territorial waters. This led to a serious case of manslaughter. When the wreck was discovered in 1975, the ship gave divers, historians and ocean liner enthusiasts a great fascination and the interest still grows in the present day. However, the one thing that hasn't or has rarely been touched on is life on board the Britannic before the sinking. Through the life and career of the HMHS Britannic, many hospital ships during the First World War have been swept under the rug. Now, with the recent discovery of a memoir written by Nurse Ada Garland and the interviews of Sheila Macbeth Mitchell and Violet Jessup, we will be able to get a glimpse of what life was like on board the Britannic in 1916 and what would life be like on board other hospital ships in a nurse's point of view. Before we begin, we need to explain a little information about hospital ships and what the nurses do before they would have access to work on board them. A hospital ship would have been requisitioned by the British government to assist and transport wounded, sick and shipwrecked officers. The responsibility of each ship, whether big or small, would be to travel to base camps or travel back to countries with more accessible treatment for patients, while there would be nurses and doctors who would look after them before landing on dry land. Sounds easy, right? Unfortunately, this is incorrect. Being a nurse on board an ocean liner is hard work as an amount of training had to be required before doctors and nurses would come on board. The job had to require a lot of training, travelling, medical examinations and interviews. All of these would have been led at a nurse training college inside Trudegia House. All of these interviews would have been led by a doctor and in addition to these requirements, the nurses had to manage in a fast-paced environment, go through different shifts and be able to quickly learn extra skills like first aid. If applicants were successful, the voluntary aid detachment would provide volunteer nurses with a uniform which would cost 60 guineas and an allowance of 15 guineas or pounds a year. All training had to be done within a six-month period where nurses had to attend lectures on nursing, including learning how to wash a dummy, making or mending clothes like aprons and taking their own temperatures, and cookery lessons. When the training was complete, the nurses had to live in the wards of a London hospital called Church House VAD Hospital. Living there would be separate groups of 20 nurses, including one matron nurse. 
A matria nurse was a senior nurse who would be responsible for looking over hospital wards alongside a clinical doctor or director and a manager. While there, the nurses would be given positions in special military bases. One example of this is Sheila Macbeth entering military nursing at the Queen Alexandria Military Service. Some nurses had to travel long distances to get to the bases where they had to await orders to be assigned to work on battlefields in other countries, at home or on board hospital ships. This was how Sheila, Violet Jessup and Ada Garland were assigned onto the HMHS Britannic. The Britannic left Southampton docks on the 12th of November 1916 where she would make her way to her first destination, which would be Naples. This would then be followed by travelling to Serbia to pick up wounded soldiers. However, plans would later change following a storm which damaged another hospital ship, the Aquitania, and the Britannic had to take her place to collect soldiers from the Kia Channel in Greece. While the White Star liner was sailing on the open sea, Sheila, Violet and Ada wouldn't have had time to rest as they had to begin their duties straight away. Life on board the HMHS Britannic was often a difficult one and according to Ada, she wrote in her memoir about the living conditions during the voyage and how unpleasant it would have been. When the nurses, doctors or volunteers were on board, they would be assigned to their cabins on the ship's seven decks, decks A to G. However, the cabins Ada, Sheila and Violet would stay in would be varied. Ada recalls the cabins where the doctors and nurses stayed in would have rooms that would fit two people at a time and some of them had uncomfortable accommodations. These accommodations would occur in the inside part of the Britannic, where the nurses had to deal with hot and stuffy environments as the electric light and electric fans remained on throughout the Britannic's voyage. The other wards would have accommodated injured soldiers, especially those who were bedridden and had severe injuries and some of them would be life-threatening. For them, 23 wards would be occupied, These cabins were named according to the alphabet, which started with the beginning letter of a surname. Each ward would accommodate over 3,000 patients. The wards were divided into blocks and each one would have been put in charge by a sister who would lead her staff, sisters and voluntary aid detachment volunteers. Although she didn't write which ward number she worked in, she did describe the scenery In the block where I was placed, there were six wards. One had 244 beds, 108, 76, 38, 12, and the mental ward of 20 beds. The men's dining room was used for a variety of rooms. It was used for the laboratory, dispensary, operating theater, the dental surgery, and the barber's shop. Nurses also had access to saloons, the post office and the kitchens where some of them would cook meals like they would have done whilst they were training in London. Also, nurses, doctors and patients had to go through a series of regular lifeboat drills and according to Ada, they would have to parade in lifebelts. It's not clear the exact time the training would have begun, but the drills would have likely occurred after breakfast. In her memoir, Ada would describe how the practices would have taken place. We were sent to different parts of the ship and when the siren sounded its three blasts, which was the danger signal, you had to run as hard as you could for the boat deck. If you could reach your cabin for your life belt, all was well and good, but there were watertight doors all over the ship that would have been divided it into small compartments each compartment having an emergency staircase which led to the boat deck. After putting a lifebelt on and tying it securely, we all lined up on deck. At the same time, the huge electric driven cranes started lowering the boats, two on each side so four boats could be lowered at once. There were also hand cranes which collapsible boats attached lowered as well. 
In these drills, everything was carried out just as if it was real danger, only we didn't get in the boats and have rides. In other words, the lifeboats wouldn't be lowered unless there was a real emergency to escape the ship. This emergency came true when the HMHS Britannic struck the mine and sank in the ocean. Although 30 people died in the disaster, Ada Garland, Sheila Macbeth Mitchell and Violet Jessup survived. Ada escaped into lifeboat 17, but the lifeboat stopped halfway when the lifeboat's plug wasn't in the bottom. The occupants were suspended in mid-air, but luckily the plug was found and everyone escaped unharmed. Sheila didn't manage to get to her cabin to retrieve her life belt as the watertight doors were shut following the ship's impact on the mine. She went up on deck without one and she was criticised for not retrieving it. Luckily, she managed to reach her cabin by going through a narrow staircase, passing the dining room. She also managed to collect her cheese waistcoat, her grey army coat and her blanket. She remained on the Britannic while the ship was dangerously listing down by the head. Sheila didn't say which number she was on, but she did mention in her interview was how close the lifeboat was to the propellers and was turning rounds. It was nearly destroyed by the propellers, however, Sheila bravely took an oar from a stoker and rowed away just in time. However, it was a different story for Violet. Violet managed to get into a lifeboat, which would be lifeboat number four. However, number four was sucked into the ship's propellers and Violet had to jump into the water before the boat was destroyed. While she was under the water, Violet reported she had hit her head on something. It's not known what she had hit it on, but it is likely that her head was hit underneath the Britannic or on one of the blades on the ship's propellers. This would cause her to have severe headaches for the rest of her life. When she rose out of the water, she managed to swim towards another lifeboat and was pulled in. Later on, Sheila and Violet gave interviews on their encounters with family friends while Ada wrote her memoir by a neighbour. It's thanks to these that we can learn to live on board a hospital ship and how the ladies would have coped on board before the ship sank in 1916. To end this video, write in the comment sections down below if you think you would have a coped on board a hospital ship and why. Everyone on the History Insider Nutshell team is looking forward to reading them and having a discussion on the topic. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Insider Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.